Good morning. Welcome to Temple Presbyterian Church. We're excited that you're here with us today. We're joining us uh, by live stream. If you'll take out your bulletins, we do have a few announcements this morning. October is a busy month for us, a lot going on. Um, next Sunday, we will celebrate the Sacrament of the Lord's Supper, and so we would encourage you uh, to uh, spend some time this week just in preparation for that. Uh, scriptures say that we're to come in a, in a worthy manner, we're to examine ourselves, uh, which means uh, that we would come confessing our sin, we would come uh, in, a, in a state of neediness to, to meet the Lord, to need His grace, and to seek to uh, have our faith grown through uh, the Lord's Supper. So please prepare for that and, uh, for next Sunday, um, and the session will meet next Sunday, not today. And so if there's anything else that you needed to get to us, you have another week. Yes, ma'am. Yes, which I forgot to put in, though my wife reminded me many times. Um, so ladies, yes, circle meeting is tomorrow night, 630 uh, here at the church. Um, we have two collection boxes in the uh, fellowship hall. Um, one is for bags of candy for our fall festival. I want to encourage you to, uh, to join us for that. We have a lot of different ways uh, that you can come and serve, um, but certainly uh, one of the biggest things you can do is to invite, uh, to tell your friends and family and neighbors about it. Um, so there's a, a box in the uh, fellowship hall for bags of candy. You can help us out that way as well. And then also there's another box uh, to collect uh, non-perishable food items. Um, Tender Hearts Ministry in York uh, puts together Thanksgiving meals for, uh, for, for different folks. And so they're asking us to donate what we can. Um, and so the, both of those boxes are in the fellowship hall. Uh, with men's gathering uh, next Saturday, this is open to all men. Would encourage all who can come to come. Uh, Tim Whitmer is a, is a wonderful uh, writer and speaker. He's coming to speak, particularly on uh, on shepherding uh, for elders, but it really is uh, for all men. And so, 8:30 to 1 on Saturday over at Filbert's uh, PCA, and then again our fall festival, which is coming up on the 30th of this month. Did want to um, just make note uh, last Sunday as we talked about and looked at um, Genesis uh, chapter 26, we talked about the idea of generational sin, about uh, sometimes uh, it seems that, that the children uh, follow in the footsteps of their parents in good ways and sometimes in bad, and so we can have this view that... Uh, as Christians, maybe we're just simply doomed to sort of follow in our parents' footsteps. Whatever sins or vices they had, then we're, we, we will quickly follow in their footsteps as well. And in, in, in Jesus Christ, that's not true. There is freedom from sin. There's freedom from patterns and habits that we've seen even growing up. And so uh, there was some uh, extra material that I was drawing from. And so... Um, I have extra copies of this if you're interested in just uh, if there's particular uh, sin in your life or even things that you've looked back and seen in the life of your family and just wondered, am I uh, going to um, suffer in that way as well? Am I going to sort of pass that along to my kids and my grandkids? There's some wonderful uh, scripture that talks about freedom that comes through Christ that we're not uh, destined to simply uh, follow in those footsteps. And so uh, I've got extra copies, and if you'd like one, you can see me afterwards. Our call to worship this morning comes from 2 Timothy chapter 2 and says, The saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he is faithful, we cannot, he, for he cannot deny himself. And some have said, well, it certainly seems that as Paul writes to Timothy, it should have said, um, if we are faithless, uh, he will be faithless to us. And yet it doesn't say that. It says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. Because he cannot deny himself. What a wonderful truth that even as we sin, even as believers, as we, we tend at times to walk away from him, he continues to pursue. Uh, that we can't out his grace and his mercy and his love. Uh, that if, if at times we are faithless, he is still faithful to us through Jesus Christ. And that is a, a great promise that we have. That is a great truth that we celebrate this morning. Uh, we're called into the presence of this God who is faithful always to us through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we are reminded of our own faithlessness even this week. We're reminded of 
sin in our lives, we're reminded of times where we have, um, uh, through our behavior, denied you, um, and yet you've endured with us. Uh, you have uh, been faithful to us. Uh, you um, continue to love us through Jesus Christ. And we're grateful this morning for those truths. We ask that you'd help us to live in those truths. We ask that you would uh, help us to worship this morning because of those truths. Uh, that we are here this morning because of your faithfulness. We, uh, we were, we're drawn here, we were brought here by you through your Spirit because of your faithfulness. And we would ask that you'd receive our worship this morning. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's uh, continue our worship or begin our worship with our first hymn, number 215, When Morning Gilds the Skies. Please stand. Please be seated. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Hebrews chapter 12, and it uh, may seem like a strange, uh, oddly picked uh, scripture reading this morning, but our, our text for our sermon has to do with uh, Jacob and Esau, and Jacob stealing the, the birthright uh, from Esau, or being given the birthright that God had promised uh, to Jacob. Um, and so we're reminded even in the New Testaments that uh, we are to follow after Jacob uh, and his life and not Esau, that Jacob is the, the picture of, of one who's been saved and called by the Lord, and Esau is one who would go the way of the world. And so we're reminded in Hebrews 12, 15 and 17, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. And by it, many become defiled. That no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. It means not that he truly repented and, and was rejected. It means that uh, he, he did not truly repent. And he was uh, rejected by the Lord. And so this morning we are called to fall after Christ, uh, who has purchased for us, who has bought for us an eternal birthright, an eternal inheritance, and it is given to us this morning. Let's go again to the Lord in prayer this morning as we lift up a host of requests. Father, we, uh, we do come today, and we do not come in our own strength. Uh, we don't come in our own abilities. We don't come as ones uh, worthy 
uh, going to you and saying, well, well, look at how great we are, God. Of course you love us. No, if we understand our own hearts and our own sin, we, we come, uh, in a sense, feeling very unworthy. Uh, we come uh, very needy and desperate today um, because we know we are sinners. We were born sinners, and we continue in it. Um, but, Father, we come into your presence this morning um, having repented, having turned from our sin, uh, because you called us. Um, you created in us new hearts and new desires and new affections. And so, Lord, we come this morning um, worthy, not because of our own innate worthiness, uh, but because of Christ and his worthiness, the worthiness that he gives to us. And so we do come boldly this morning. We come, uh, yes, needy, uh, living in a fallen world. Uh, yes, as a people who have continued to sin, and yet we come in your presence uh, boldly as, as children to a father. And we run into your arms and excitedly and expectantly uh, speak with you. And we ask, we ask boldly, uh, because we know our Father uh, loves us and loves to give good gifts. So, Father, we pray that you would shower upon us uh, continuously um, your presence, your, um, your goodness. Uh, and, Father, we ask that you also would be um, one who can um, deliver on promises, one who has made sure and, uh, and wonderful promises to us. Uh, Father, you are one who can and has the might to affect changes in this world. And so we come today, Father, in a, in a very chaotic world. Uh, it seems to grow in chaos. It seems to grow in difficulty. It seems uh, that uh, where we may feel in, in the past we lived in a, in a bubble here in America, uh, it feels that that bubble has burst and, and the, uh, the rest of the world is, uh, is pressing down around us. Uh, Father, we feel the, uh, the grips of a, a global pandemic uh, that, that affects all of us, Lord. So many of our neighbors and our members here and our friends are still uh, struggling under um, this coronavirus. Uh, Father, uh, pastors and elders, um, lay people, uh, neighbors, family members, uh, Lord, we've, uh, we've lifted up a host of, of individuals who have, uh, some who have succumbed uh, to this and have gone to be with you, uh, some who have uh, perished and passed away, some who linger in the hospital, Lord, um, in very serious states, uh, some who have come home, Lord, and uh, seem to have no ill effects, and some perhaps even today are, are recognizing the beginnings uh, of new symptoms. Lord, we um, we're surrounded by this virus, and we can't seem to get away from it. Uh, we, are, um, we are plagued with it, Lord, and it affects our, our family and our friends. It affects our, our lives, our health. So, Lord, we ask that you would um, eradicate it, uh, remove it, uh, wipe it away. Uh, Father, for those who are in the hospital, uh, we pray that you would heal them bring them to full health. Uh, for those who are home but still lingering under its effects, Lord, give them strength, uh, return their vitality, uh, return their energies. Um, Father, protect your people here. Uh, Father, we gather each Sunday um, as we're called to do. Um, and so, Father, protect us as we gather. Uh, keep us safe and healthy. Um, Lord, we would ask even that uh, you would uh, use as you've promised to do, uh, use uh, tragedy, use death, use sickness uh, to bring about something far greater. Uh, each of us knows someone perhaps who is, uh, is struggling under uh, doubt and unbelief, um, a rejection of you. And so, Father, we pray that you would bring uh, salvation in the lives of many uh, who don't know you, who have trusted uh, for many years in themselves or in uh, others uh, care and love for them and governments uh, in, in something of this world, Lord. Um, and now some of those things begin to crumble. Lord, use even this coronavirus, use sickness uh, to bring about salvation for those who don't know you. And for those who do know you, Father, we pray that you would restore and renew our faith uh, as it wavers and ebbs and flows at times. Grow us in a deeper understanding of, uh, of our own weakness and our sinfulness and the, the magnitude and the might of your love for us, that you 
so loved uh, sinners in this world that you sent Jesus Christ uh, to live a holy life we could not, to, to die the death we deserve, and to rise again to defeat sin and death. Uh, Father, give us a renewed sense of hope, even this day, in Christ's name. And Lord, be with us uh, as we continue to lift up our prayers, and even now as we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord has told us to bring into the storehouse, and our gathering weekly, our gathering for worship, is, is the storehouse. And he tells us to bring the full tithe, uh, to bring what he is commanded to bring each week. He says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing, until there is no more need. The Lord tells us to, to bring in faith tithes and offerings. He, he tells us that as we do that, our resources will not ultimately be depleted. He will continue to provide. He will provide us our daily bread. And so as we come this morning to a time of tithes and offerings, let's do so expectantly in faith that the Lord will provide for us, and let's do it with joy. Let's continue to worship this morning as we sing our next hymn, number 347, And Can It Be? We'll sing uh, the first three verses of that. Please stand and sing with us.
Please be seated as you are. If you'll take out your copy of God's Word this morning as we continue in our series in the book of Genesis. Again, we are taking a, a number of uh, months uh, to go through the book of Genesis. Uh, we began uh, looking at um, Genesis 1 through 11, uh, laying out uh, creation and the order. We moved from there into the life of Abraham, and now we're into the lives of the patriarchs Isaac and Jacob. And so Genesis 27 is where we begin this morning. Again, uh, I'm not going to read the entirety of uh, 27 right now. We'll, we will get to all of it in the sermon, but uh, begin with me in uh, Genesis 27 verse 1. When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son. And he answered, Here I am. He said, Behold, I am old, and I do not know the day of my death. Now then, take your weapons, your quiver and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me. Prepare for me delicious food, such as I love, and bring it to me so that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die." Now Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So when Esau went to the field to hunt it for game and bring it, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, I heard your father speaking to your brother Esau. Bring me game and prepare for me delicious food that I may eat it and bless you before the Lord before I die. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice as I command you. Go to the flock and bring me two good young goats so that I may prepare from them delicious food for your father, such as he loves. And you shall bring it to your father to eat, so that he may bless you before he dies. Let's pray this morning. Father, a, a tangled web is woven in these chapters of deceit and intrigue, of family members against one another conspiring. Uh, Lord, uh, we ask this morning that you would uh, remind us of the hope that we have in you, you are a faithful father. You are not like uh, these earthly fathers. You are faithful and good and loving, and we can trust you. And so we pray this morning that you would teach us today. Amen. I was trying to think through how to introduce a, a story like this in chapter 27. Uh, it is truly a, uh, a tangled web of deception, of lies, of, uh, of moves and counter moves. Um, of, of certainly lying between family members. A uh, host of movies and TV shows come to mind. Uh, a movie where the star uh, could not lie for a period of time and the difficulty that he had because he was a compulsive liar. Uh, and everything that came out of his mouth was true. And uh, everything that he said was, was right on, but it was offensive to many who had to hear it. And We've spoken before of the Andy Griffith show where, where truth is something that is handled uh, very lightly uh, each time as, as they're seeking to sort of uh, soften the blow of, of truth. Uh, there was a, a show many years ago called All in the Family uh, where Archie Bunker uh, was uh, sort of everybody's, uh, you know, um, grumpy old uncle. And he would sit in his chair and, and family members would come and go. And, and certainly Archie Bunker was, uh, was a racist and, and the family was dysfunctional. And there was uh, lying and, and it, was, it was made into a comedy. But as we look at a show like that, as we look at other shows that depict family life, we see that uh, uh, if it's not sort of covered over with a, a, a veneer of, 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 of rosiness, then as it, it begins to open up what families in this world look like, we, we begin to see that Maybe there is far more in this uh, story in Genesis 27 that is, that is reality. Uh, that while our fa families may not be quite this bad, if we look back over any length of time, we see that there is dysfunction, even in the, the best of families. Uh, there, is, there can be deceit. Uh, there can be uh, rivalries. There can be those who try and outdo one another in large ways and small. And so when we come to chapter 27, our temptation might be to say, Phew, at least my family's not like that. But then as we dig a little bit deeper, as we see their heart motivations, maybe we begin to have our, our, own, uh, our own hearts open up a bit, our own motivations, and we say, you know, men that have lived or done this, but there's, there's some kernels of truth there. I see that in, in, in this depiction of the family, in these 
lives, I see a bit of myself. I see a desire to sort of hide or, or, or cover the truth for my own benefit or to save someone else's feelings. Uh, maybe there's been a bit of favoritism in my own heart towards a parent or towards a child or, or a family member. Um, maybe there has been a deceitfulness uh, in, in small ways uh, as I try and, and, and get what I want over other people. And so as we come to this passage, our, our tendency is to quickly say, oh, well, this is just, this is the worst of the worst. Really doesn't have anything to do with me, but pray this morning that the Lord would, in gentle ways, begin to show us how are we like the characters here. How are we like Jacob? How are we like Isaac? Like Rebecca? Like Esau? Uh, we spent time last week uh, looking at the idea of like father, like son. Uh, that oftentimes, uh, as, as parents, we pass on to our children traits, good traits, good abilities, good characteristics, uh, both physical and, and emotional, but sometimes we also pass along other traits that are not quite as good. We saw that uh, Isaac lived in the land, and the land was barren. There was a famine at the time, and his wife as well, Rebecca, um, was barren, could not have children, but then the Lord uh, overcame that and gave them Jacob and Esau, uh, but it, it revealed in these two children uh, the, the continuing and the coming uh, animosity between uh, the people of God and the people of this world. And so uh, we certainly overall saw that uh, though there is uh, sin in the lives of God's people, God is faithful to bring about his promises. And so our, our point today really is this, that God keeps his word despite, despite the prevailing unbelief and unfaithfulness of his people. God fulfilled his word despite Isaac's opposition, we will see in a minute, despite Rebekah and Jacob's manipulation, and despite Esau's indifference. That in spite of all of those traits, all of the sin that's working in this story here, that God is still faithful God is still faithful to his promises. And why is he faithful to his promises? Why has he been faithful to you over the years? Has it, become, has it, has it been because you're such a stellar, great person? I love you all, but we're all sinners. And God has not been faithful to us because of us. He's been faithful to us because of himself. He is faithful to himself. When he makes promises, he is being faithful to himself. God's purpose for man's ultimate good will stand. We cannot frustrate God's ultimate plans. God is faithful, and that is good news this morning. As we read through this chapter 27, as perhaps we begin to, to pull away the layers of our own lives, and we, we begin to sort of cringe and say, yeah, that, I didn't do that, but it's something similar. That reminds me of me, or that, that cuts a little bit too close to home. We, we can leave here feeling beaten down and, and overwhelmed by our sin, but no, we need to be reminded that, that in spite of your sin, in spite of ways that we have worked against God, He is faithful. He is faithful through Jesus Christ in your life, and that is good news this morning because we all come in some degree of sin, and so we need to be reminded of God's faithfulness, that His ultimate plans cannot be thwarted his plan cannot be thwarted, even by his people. And so we look at this story of, of Jacob and Esau, of Isaac and Rebekah, and back and forth, and some choosing one child and another choosing the other, and, and brothers fighting against one another. And, and, and we, we see just the, the, the disaster that it is. We see all the difficulty here, and we might be quick to look at it and say, well, who's to blame? For everything that goes on here, we like to assign blame, right? Um, perhaps as a parent, you, you've, you've gone and said, all right, who broke the glass in the kitchen? Well, it wasn't me. It was, it was him, or, or she did it, or, uh, you know, we, we quickly want to assign blame. Who did it? Mostly because then that person gets in trouble. They have to clean it up. They have to buy the glass, and we don't. So we come to this, and, and who's to blame here? Who's ultimately to blame for all the chaos? Is it, uh, is it Isaac? As the patriarch, as the father of the family, doesn't he bear responsibility for all that goes on in his family? Is it, is it Rebecca, uh, a wife and a mother who is sort of scheming behind the scenes uh, to, to, to have blessing fall upon her favorite son? 
Is it Jacob who is known as a deceiver, as a liar? Is it Esau who who is uh, certainly placed no value in the past on blessings? Now the answer here is it's not one out of the four, it's, it's all of them. They're all to blame here. Every one of them adds a piece to the, the tangled web of deception here. One writer said, Everyone in the family sought the blessings of God without bending the knee to God. Think on that for a minute. Everyone in the family sought the blessings of God without bending the knee to God. They wanted the benefits without the relational obedience. They wanted the good things from God, but they weren't willing to do it in a way that God had told them to. They weren't willing to obediently follow after him. They tried to circumvent that, to go around it, to try and make it happen themselves. Is this us this morning? Do we weary uh, of, of God's slow pace in answering our prayers? Do we weary of the answers that he does give that aren't quite exactly what we asked for and want? Once we've prayed and and sort of either not received an answer immediately or not received the answer we wanted, do we sort of quickly take the reins back and say, all right, God, I've got it from here. I'm going to be in charge now. Um, Yes, I love you and I need you, but I'm I'm going to do things my way. So this morning, let's look at four things. Isaac's opposition, Rebecca's ordering, Jacob's orchestration, and Esau's outrage. And I hope that each week you marvel at my ability to come up with these O's, four O's, because I struggle with it. Um, I'm kidding. But uh, Isaac's opposition, and he's opposed to God's will. Because remember, earlier on, God has told uh, Isaac and Rebekah that Jacob, the younger, will be in charge of the family. He will receive God's blessing. And this is not the order of this culture. Esau, the oldest, was to receive the the lion's share. He was to be in charge and the leader of the family. But God said, no, it is not going to be that way. The older will serve the younger. And so when Isaac seeks to orchestrate a different way, he is really opposing God's will and his plan. And so we see Isaac's sin here. We see his sin of favoritism over uh, of, of Esau over Jacob. Um, And his favoritism really comes from a a deep passion for feasting. He loves food. He's motivated by his stomach and not his character. We perhaps uh, see where Esau got his uh, way of dealing with things. Because remember early on when Esau came in from the field, he was famished, he said. He was parched. He was about undone. And he went to Jacob to get him some food. And Jacob said, well, I'll give this to you if you will give me your birthright. And Esau, far more interested in in being uh, physically fed, gives up his birthright and loses his spiritual feeding. And so maybe Isaac and Esau are birds of a feather, like father, like son. Uh, One writer said this, he said, uh, as as Isaac has gotten older here, He tells Esau to go and to take your weapons and to prepare a delicious meal. He says, such as I love, my son, you know how much I love what you bring in, how you you season it and use spices and the way you cook it. And it's it's wonderful. I, I love it. So go do that. Bring it to me. And then you sort of don't tell anybody, but then I'll bless you. I'll bless you. Um. And so writer goes on, he says, and dreams of a hunter's feast filled his vacant eyes, filled Isaac's eyes that were failing. Uh, Perhaps he had cataracts, perhaps he had gone blind, but he could no longer see with his eyes. And so his, his, the eyes of his stomach began to take over and he could see and taste the meal that Esau would prepare for him. If you ever read the, the Chronicles of Narnia stories in the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the, the, the first in that series, um, there's a scene where uh, the, the White Witch is coming through Narnia with all of its winter surrounding them, and uh, she's in her sleigh. She comes upon the, the freezing uh, person um, of, uh, and now I can't remember his name, um, the youngest. Edmund, thank you. 
I didn't write it down here. Edmund is there, and he's gone into Narnia, and he has uh, fled from his brothers and sisters whom he hated, and he, he comes upon uh, the, the white witch, and she lures him. She attracts him. She has something called Turkish delight. She asks him, what can I give you? And he says, oh, Turkish delight. That would be what I would love to have. And so she, she creates it for him. And, and so Edmund becomes the, the betrayer of Aslan, the lion. He becomes the Judas to Jesus, as it were. Uh, and he is drawn away from the path of righteousness, away from Aslan uh, by the, the White Witch, not by wealth or power or uh, supernatural abilities. He is drawn by uh, a plate of, of delicious, she calls them, delights, uh, with a plate of, of just some desserts. His heart is drawn away. Um, and we see that a bit here that... Uh, that Isaac's heart is drawn away from obedience to the Lord, uh, not, not by uh, huge, vast wealth or power or kingdoms, but simply with what his son will bring him at the end of a bow. And so the old adage proves to be true here. Uh, the, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Uh, and we see that his heart, Isaac's heart here, is revealed uh, through his stomach as well. And so... There is sin in Isaac's heart of favoritism, of, of feasting, um, but also of forgetting. He forgets that uh, God had already promised the inheritance to Jacob. And so when Esau moves forward to bless Esau, um, he's forgetting God's proclamation, God's promised plan. Um, and now he is uh, forcing an early blessing. He says, I don't know if my days are many or few, and I can't see very well, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the blessing now. Um, and so what did he seek? He sought to control and manipulate God's blessing uh, toward his favorite son, Esau. But what did he get? Isaac now would throw his family into chaos, into rebellion, in the end, he would follow God's will, but in the process, he would lose his family. And I pray and hope that that's not uh, reminiscent or doesn't speak of our own family lives. Maybe there's things that we've done that have at times thrown our families into chaos. Maybe you grew up in a family of chaos, a, a father or mother who, who sinned or lived a particular way that, that your family life was chaotic. The good news is that there's hope in Christ there's hope in Christ for families, even chaotic ones, especially chaotic ones. Uh, dads, if we are a little bit more like Isaac than we would want to admit, there's hope for us. Grandfather's here as well. And so Isaac would seek to uh, oppose God's will, uh, but in the end he would submit. Rebecca seeks to order things in her own way. She seeks to order the event events in their lives to bring about her own will as well. So you have parents who are working at opposition to one another. Verse 5, we, we see her step in, and, and, and it says that she was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. Maybe it's innocence. Uh, maybe when the two of them gather, she listens in a little bit more intently. Uh, but now Rebecca would seek to order things in the way that she thought was best. There's nothing more destructive in a family than when mother and father are working against one another. And children become particularly adept at figuring out how to play mom and dad off one another, right? Mom, I want to have somebody spend the night this coming Friday. Ask your dad, she says. Go to your dad, and dad, I want to have somebody spend the night this Friday. And we'll ask your mom. Well, mom said to come ask you, and it's okay with her if it's okay with you. And so the dad says, well, sure. And the mom comes back and says, why would you let them have someone spend the night Friday? Why don't we talk about this? Kids are very adept at figuring out the communication and how to manipulate. And so here we have Isaac and Rebecca who are at cross purposes. Uh, they are scheming to bring about benefits for their favorite. We've talked before about the, the, the disaster that it is in a family when parents favor one over the other. But we have maybe in one instance, this might even be called the first Halloween. Halloween is coming up on the 31st and uh, costumes are, are being sold. And maybe even now you're thinking about what you will wear as you go door to door. 
as one called it, shamelessly begging for candy. Uh, but we put costumes on, and it's fun to dress up. Um, and there was a, a there was a, a TV show recently where for Halloween they dressed up like one another, sort of their opposite polar opposite in the family. And one would dress like this person, and they would dress like the other. And it was fun at the beginning until they began to mimic the mannerisms and the, uh, the, the ways of that particular person. It became very offensive to the other to see their behaviors uh, acted out through this other person. And there was humor there, but it was also causing great dysfunction. Um, but Rebecca here would create a costume for her son. Uh, amazingly, she would create a costume to resemble and look like uh, her other child. She said to uh, Jacob, go to the field and, and act like Esau. Uh, bring in a game and, and I'll prepare it. And so well will I prepare it that when it's brought to your father, he will think that you are Esau. Um, and so we see a variety of, uh, of sin that Rebecca is perpetrating here. Um, it it reminds me a bit of a movie years ago called The Sting, which we, we seem to like movies where, where one group is, is seeking to steal from another or to, to perpetrate a crime on them or to take from them. Um, and this is what Rebecca is doing. She is creating this elaborate uh, way to perpetrate a con on her own husband and her own child. And she's using Jacob in the mix. Uh, and so Rebecca's sin is multifaceted. There's familial sin. Uh, meaning that um, uh, she sets up something very familiar for Isaac to be drawn in. Uh, this food that she would bring and the way that she would dress up Jacob to resemble Esau is being used by her. Um, hers is also a faulty theology. Um, she, uh, she believes the core of being that God needs help. Because remember, God had said to both she and Isaac that Jacob would be the leader. He would receive the blessing, and Esau would serve him, the opposite of the culture. And so her, her actions begin to display that she doesn't understand God. She doesn't think that maybe God's up to the task. Because wait a minute, all of a sudden, she overhears Isaac is about to bless Esau. And so God's plans are about to be thwarted. God needs help. If I don't rush in right now and save this, things are not going to turn out well. They're not going to turn out the way that God intended them to. So her theology is very much that, uh, that, that God needs her help to carry out his plans. In a way that God can certainly rescue this. But we see that she continues with further sinning as she tells Jacob that um, he is to go and, and, and kill the animal. She will prepare it. Um, and then after all this happens, and we'll see the outcome of that, uh, she then tells Jacob not to take responsibility, not to have their sin revealed and confess it and ask for forgiveness from Isaac and Esau. No, she says, now that your brother is planning to kill you because of this con, you need to flee. So she compounds her sin by, by encouraging her son, don't confess, don't take ownership, don't reconcile, run. And so a mother's sin continues to deepen. Um, and we see a mother here who also has a sense of uh, uh, letting nothing go to waste. Uh, she says that we're going to use the, the meat of the animal to, to feed your father, and we're going to use the skin of the animal to deceive your brother. And so when that animal is killed, nothing goes to waste. The meat is used as part of the con, and the skin is used to cover over their deception. Maybe it brings to mind, as we've spoken before, back to Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve are in the garden and they have sinned and they have given in to Satan's temptations. And now they hear God coming into the garden and they run and they hide. And God says, where are you? And they said, we were afraid because we heard you coming and we knew we were naked. And God says, well, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? And and they said they indeed had, and they began to blame one another back and forth. The dysfunction of the family begins between husband and wife, mother and father. And yet, we see another animal slain at that point. The animals that was killed, the skin of which was used to cover them. Their nakedness was now covered 
their shame was now covered. And it was to be a picture of the blood of Jesus Christ that covers us, that covers our nakedness, our shame, our sin. And so with Rebecca and Jacob, they would take this animal and they would use the skin to, to, to cover their deception, as it were. Whereas with the Lord, he takes the skin of his animal to cover uh, the sin and deception of Adam and Eve. And in Christ, our sin, our deception has been covered as well. So I pray this morning that that's true for you. That the, animal, the, 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 the blood of one ha, has been shed in your place. And the blood of that has been used to cover you, to cover your sin. And the person whose blood it was is Jesus Christ. A skin, as it were, is covering you to cover your sin, to pay for your sin. And so what did she seek? To bring about God's blessing on her favorite son, giving God the, the help that she believed that he needed. But what did she get? She had to send her favorite son away into exile to keep him safe from es Esau's coming wrath. And she would also lose, very likely, the trust of both Isaac and Esau in this deception. And so when we sin, when we lie, when we cover up, we never ultimately get what we want. If we think about who's to blame in this story for the chaos, some have said, well, Rebecca was just simply doing what she needed to do. Isaac was the sinner. He, he was trying to rob Jacob of the blessing and give it to Esau. He was the one who was going against God. Rebecca just simply tried to get things back to a state of normal, see, and so they would say, in essence, the, the, the ends justify the means. She had to lie. She had to deceive because the end of, of, of Jacob being blessed had to happen, right? And so do the ends justify the means? Someone would say, wouldn't it wouldn't be better for her to, to break a few of God's uh, less important laws to make sure that his long-term purpose stands? In her own lives, isn't it true that when we're talking to people... Isn't it okay to just to hedge on the truth, to, to tell white lies because we want to save that person, we want to protect that person? We don't want to have to confront them on their lives or what they're doing, so we, we, we hedge the truth, we, we cut the edges, and because isn't it more important that, that, that the greater good is, is met and we just need to break a few of God's less important laws. And I, I do that because there are no less important laws. There are no less important commands that God gives. When God commands it, when God says it, it is equally important. God is not going to tell us to do something that he's not laid out the way for us to accomplish it. If he tells us to do something, he's laid out the way that we're to do it and accomplish it. Maintaining his other commands his commands are never at cross-purpose with one another. And so Rebekah should have trusted that God could bring about the blessing of Jacob without her deception. Should not have violated God's command of thou shalt not lie, bear false witness, thou shalt not steal. She should have trusted God that God was the one who was going to carry this out. She should have confronted her husband lovingly to remind him, no, God's promise was that the blessing would go to Jacob and not to Esau. But no, she, in her own scheming, conniving way, uh, seeks to control. Because the goal and the means must both be godly. The goal, the end, must be godly as well as the, the way that we get there. Matthew 4 reminds us of, of a, uh, a shortcut that was offered to Jesus when he was being tempted in the wilderness. When Satan came to him and told him that I can give you all the kingdoms of the world, I can in essence give you exactly what you've been sent here to do, I can give it to you. If you will just simply, just simply bow down and worship me. So Christ could have, in his humanity, uh, way we think, well, the ultimate goal is still going to happen. I'm, I'm going to reign and I'm going to have all the kings of the world. All I have to do is for a moment, bow down and worship. But the goal and the means must both be godly. Christ said, no, far be it that that would ever happen. I must go through my suffering. I must go through this life to receive the kings of this world, to save sinners from their own sin. I don't know if there's areas in your life where you're tempted to cut corners, 
Uh, if there's areas of your life where you're tempted to um, take back control, to, to sort of move things along. God, you're not really answering my prayers right now, so I, I got it. I don't really need to pray anymore. Uh, in my business or in my job, I've got to go along to get along, as they say. I've got to play the game. I've got to do what the boss says, even though there are things there that are unbiblical and godly. Because the ultimate goal, Lord, is I've got to provide for my family, right? The, the end is what justifies the means. And the Lord says, no, trust me. Live faithfully to me in every aspect of your life. Follow after me. Follow my commands. I will take care of your family. I will take care of you. And so we can be tempted just like Christ to cut corners, just like Rebecca. But next we see uh, Jacob's orchestration. He orchestrates the plot to deceive. He, he, he carries it out, this plot that his mother had come up with. So his sin is multiple. Uh, verse 18, uh, his first lie, as it were, might be called a, uh, a lie of presence, meaning that uh, he went to his father. Verse 18, so he went to his father and said, My father... He, Isaac said, here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Now sit up and eat my game that your soul may bless me. So Jacob could have said no to his mother. As hard as that is, a son can say no to a mother when she is telling him to do ungodly things. And yet his first sin was, was his presence there moving forward in her deception, his deception in going. His second lie, verse 19, he says with verbal deceit, I am, your, I am Esau, your firstborn. He lies about who he is. His third lie is in the latter portion of chapter, uh, verse 20. But Isaac said to his son, how is it that you have found it so quickly, my son, meaning the game that he had just sent Esau out to get? He, Isaac, answered, because the Lord your God granted me success. So he compounds the lie with a theological deceit. Because the Lord, your God, granted me success. There's, there's bold-faced blasphemy here that he's invoking the name of God to, to, to augment his lie. And it's further telling, as commentary on, on Jacob's spiritual state, that he doesn't say, my God or our God. He says, your God. His fourth lie comes in verses 22 and 23. Uh, so Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, who felt him, felt his arms, his, his face, as it were, and said, the voice, of Jake, uh, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. There's a visual deceit that is perpetrated on Isaac here as well. So uh, ingenious was the costume that Rebekah made for Jacob that when uh, Jacob, in his blindness, reached out to, to touch the face of, of, of his son, uh, to feel his arms, he felt the hairiness that was there, and he immediately assumed, well, that has to be Esau, because Jacob is, is, is largely hairless. He's a smooth-skinned son, so, of course, it must be Esau has come back with my, my game. I'm ready to eat. So complete was the deception that he blesses Jacob, thinking that it's Esau. In the bread box in the lobby, again, the bread box is for all of you, but particularly for young children to look and see uh, a visual of something that is in the sermon. So kids, uh, in there, you may have looked and seen uh, two what look like uh, um, uh, soft drink cans uh, covered. One has an A on it, one has a B on it. And your parents probably remember years ago when they used to do blind taste tests, uh, where particularly uh, they would bring and they would cover a can of Coke and a can of Pepsi. And they would ask the person to, to drink from can A, and to drink from can B. And the idea was that, um, that they should be able to tell the difference between the tastes. And if Coke was running the, uh, the taste test, then yes, the Coke was the one that they loved and liked. And if Pepsi was the one that was running the test, yes, no, it, you know, this is the one that was the better. And so can we still discern what is on the inside, even when we can't see what is on the outside? What's the, the heart of the taste test? 
Even if you can't see the can to know that it's a Coke or a Pepsi, you should still be able to tell with, with your senses, with what you put in your mouth, the taste, the flavor, which is, which is which. And so here, Rebecca and Jacob were counting on the fact that even if, they, that even if uh, um, Isaac uh, couldn't see with his eyes, that he could still be deceived by feeling the arms he could pretend to be his brother Esau, and he could get the blessing. And so Jacob's deceit is compounded, but Jacob indeed is blessed. And many stop at this point and say, well, look, God's plans came through. The ends do justify the means. Rebecca and Jacob saved the blessing from being given to the wrong person. And so good for them, but no, it's not good because Isaac does indeed give Jacob the blessing. He says, come near. He kissed him. He smelled the scent of his garments, and he blessed him. And the, the blessing that he gives is, is multifaceted. It's the direct benefit from God's hand. Verse 27, see the smell of my son is as the smell of the field that the Lord has blessed. And so the, part of the blessing is that uh, the recipient of that blessing would, would be would receive the bounty of the earth, the promised land, the produce of the land, the abundance from God. Verse 28, the dew of the land would be given. May God give you the dew of heaven, and the fatness of the earth, and plenty of grain and wine. Dew, fatness, plenty. These were all words that they would have known to, to be reminded of refreshment and prosperity. So as Isaac blesses him, he's promised him this. Then he promises him dominion over the peoples. Verse 29, let people serve you and nations bow to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. So the promise is that you would have dominion over peoples, including your family. And then lastly, this promise of a dynamic protection. The latter portion of verse 29. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be everyone who blesses you. And so the, the multifaceted nature of this blessing was wondrous. But what did Jacob seek? He sought to receive the blessings of his father, to have this blessing under his own control to happen at his own timing. But what did he get? Yes, he did receive the blessing, but he got far more than he bargained for. It. He did indeed receive that blessing, but he would have to flee into exile. He would lose the comfort of his home, the presence of his mother. He would lose any familial bond that he had with Isaac and with Esau. He would also endure his own manipulation at the hands soon of his uncle Laban, a bit of his own medicine, as it were. And so what did he seek? Blessing, but what did he get? A complex blessing. Esau is now outraged, as we conclude. He has been outflanked, he's been outdone, and he begins to understand. Verse 33 there's a moment of what some have called it an earthquake of truth, a tsunami of sudden awareness, a seismic shock of realization. Isaac's idols are now revealed as Jacob leaves, having been blessed. And Isaac is now confronted by his true son, Esau. And Esau says, bless me now. And Isaac says, well, wait a minute, who was just here? Because I thought it was you and I blessed him. And the, the, the moment of awareness crashes down upon Esau, excuse me, uh, upon Isaac. He begins to realize that he's been deceived. He also reveals, perhaps, that his own idols were being brought to the fore. His idolatry of his favorite son Esau and, and the food that he would eat it had been used against him. Isaac had put, as one writer said, his personal love of Esau ahead of the will of of God. And it wasn't just a, a crushing weight of, of guilt. There, there seems to be a true submissiveness now in Isaac, a true understanding, a true confession. Because the second part of verse 33 simply says, yes, and he shall be blessed. The realization that, yes, it was done connivingly and, and with scheme and, and, and plot, but he will be blessed. What God said will be true. And there seems to be a resignation to that. Because in Hebrews chapter 12, we're reminded of Isaac. 
and we're reminded of what Isaac did. And it, it seems strange that he would be commended for blessing Jacob, though he thought he was blessing Esau. Hebrews 12, 15 says, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it uh, many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he saw it with tears. We see there's a perhaps conversion here. Isaac's recognition of God's choice of Jacob may have come late, but his conversion is sincere. And in the New Testament, Isaac is, is, is upheld um, and commended for blessing Jacob. Esau is not given a blessing, but now he seeks one, but he's really given an anti-blessing. He went to his father and said, isn't there another blessing that I can receive? Isn't there something else, any scrap of blessing that you can give me? But unfortunately, all that is left for Esau is, in a sense, this anti-blessing. The abundance would be withdrawn from his life. Esau says, behold, away from the fatness of the earth you shall dwell. There's refreshment that is withdrawn. He says, and away from the dew of heaven on high, by your sword you shall live. There's now domination and not dominion promised. You shall serve your brother. And protection is now withdrawn. But when you grow restless, you shall break his yoke from your neck. And so there's this blessing, anti-blessing component here. There's nothing left for Esau. Esau would go and is the way of the world. And Jacob is the way of faithfulness. And so we now see in verse 41 and the tone and the tender is, is set for the next chapter. Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, The days of mourning my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. So premeditation uh, comes out of Jacob and Rebekah's sin. So what did Esau seek to continue? Have the favor of his father? Have the blessing that had been promised to Jacob, he would seek to have a normal human ordering of things, that the younger would serve the older. But what did he get? He who despised his birthright would lose everything. So I'll remind you as we began that this is not a story of family dysfunction. This is not a story to overwhelm us with, with guilt as we see ourselves here. This is not simply a story, story to say, oh, I, I, I resemble Isaac or Rebecca, or I'm not as bad as Esau. I'm, I'm a little bit better than Jacob. Story is not meant to focus upon them, but upon God's faithfulness. God will not be thwarted. God's promises will carry forward. God keeps his word despite the prevailing unbelief and unfaithfulness of his people. God fulfilled his word despite Isaac's opposition, despite Rebekah and Jacob's manipulation, and despite Esau's indifference. God is faithful to his promises. So, by way of application here at the end, that as we're maybe confronted by our sin, we need to understand and know that our sin, even while it, it may be real, even though our sin may have lasting earthly consequences for us, for our family, we cannot derail God's gracious purpose, life, uh, purpose for our lives. The good news for us who are in Jesus Christ, those of us who have had to be dragged kicking and screaming into God's wonderful, loving plan, is that he will bring it about. Even the death of his son could not thwart his ultimate plan. In fact, it was through that that his ultimate plan is fulfilled. Today, if you struggle under a difficult family, if you've added your own difficulty to that family, if you struggle in sin, take great hope in knowing that God will work out his plan in your life. He will bring you to salvation. He will bring about sanctification in your life. He will bring you to eternity in his own house. Nothing we can do through Jesus Christ can thwart that. 
Let's pray. Father, it is in Christ that we have this hope. It is in Christ that we know and believe that, that even as we continue in our sin for a time, you will not be thwarted. Your will will not be undone. Give us great hope in that, Father. Let that be the foundation with, from which we now confess our sins. Run from them. Whatever ways we resemble Isaac or Rebecca or Jacob or Esau, whatever things we've done, let us run to you, confessing them to you, knowing that you will be faithful to forgive us and to continue to work out your will in our lives, that we might resemble Jesus more and more. And ultimately, we will be brought into fellowship with you eternally. Not because of us, but because you are faithful to your promises. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's sing of this Savior who has saved us from our sins, but now leads us. Number 688, Savior like a shepherd, lead us. Please stand. Anytime we come to Scripture, we are uh, brought to multiple different places of awareness. We're revealed, and, and it is shown to us our own sin as we perhaps see our own natures, our own sinful desires, our own actions played out for us on the pages of Scripture. Maybe you resonate with Isaac a bit, or Rebecca, or Jacob, or Esau. Maybe there's a, a com combination of those in your lives, in the past or now. But much more were to be left with not just that overwhelming sense of our sin, but much more the, the overwhelming sense and surety of God's goodness. That his plans will not be thwarted. That he sent Jesus Christ to free us from those sins, to pay for them. And now we can run back to him as a father, confessing again when we live that way, but also assured that he will not leave us there. He will bring us out of our sin and ultimately 
we will be with him. So if you know Jesus Christ, receive this benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.